from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight I want you to turn with me to the 11th chapter of Matthew. The 11th chapter of Matthew. Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to speak tonight on the university of life. I want to speak to young people as well as older people on the subject of the university of life. Now, we usually think of this text that a pastor will take and use at Labor Day, but that's wrong in one sense, and yet in another sense it is correct. But this is an invitation to men and women who are exhausted with the search for truth. Jesus said, you've been searching for truth, you're tired, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You found it. The search ends with me. Now, at this university we're talking about tonight, you can fail, but you can never drop out. All over the world, people are beginning to ask questions about where civilization is headed. One of the foreign experts left Washington in, his, in despair this past summer and went back to the university to teach, and he was asked why. And he said, sometimes I get the feeling I'm sitting on a hilltop watching two trains racing toward each other on the same. It's created. Psychologists, economists, clergy, politicians are dealing with social and moral problems on a scale that they've never had to deal with before. For example, the marriage breakups, even among so-called professing Christians. Some of them well-known Christians in our newspapers even today. Married women having adulterous affairs has tripled in the last five years. But the price they pay is escalating drug addiction, alcoholism, and suicide. Racial tensions, we thought the race problem in America was settled. It's not settled. Look at Miami or Philadelphia this past summer. The psalmist said, and I said, oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and rest. Have you ever felt that way? You'd like to fly away from life and rest. You'd like to get out of that kitchen and rest. You'd like to get out of that job and rest. You'd like to fly away somewhere. Thousands of people out east come to Nevada and to California thinking that they're going to find it here. And they may find something here, but they find wonderful air here and Reno, I'll tell you that. They find beautiful mountains here. And they find a lot of activity here. But the real thing they're searching for is God. Because you see, they were made in the image of God. And without God, their hearts are restless till they come to know God. You can never find true rest until you know God. And you that are watching by television, if you want to find peace with God and rest in your own souls, call that number on your screen right now and let somebody talk to you as many people here will do later on in the evening. You see, the psalmist longing to escape has become the cry of the world today. The psalmist also said, I'm full of heaviness and looked for some to take pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. The Bible also says, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and escape will elude them. Their hope will become a dying gasp. No way out. Jesus said, I am the way out. He said, there's only one way to escape, one way out, and I'm it. You have to come by the way of the cross and the empty tomb and find reconciliation with God and peace in your heart and joy in your heart that you have lost. And how many of you are trying to escape? You've come out here from somewhere else to escape all the rigors of life somewhere else, but you haven't really found it yet. You haven't found that joy and that peace that you thought you'd find or that sense of fulfillment. You don't have the answer to the questions, where did you come from? What is life all about? Where are you going when you die? You don't have those answers yet. You can find it tonight by coming to Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus said, learn of me. It's a picture of Jesus Christ as the great professor at the university. He's the greatest teacher that ever was. The Bible says he taught them as one having authority. He spoke with authority. You never find Jesus saying, I hope this is the way. I think this is the way. The Bible says there's a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 
There are many ways in life that seem right, but the end is death, destruction, judgment, and hell. And Jesus warned about that. Jesus said, I am the way. Now, most of the world would agree that he's the greatest teacher that ever lived. And so tonight, I want you to sit for a few moments at the feet of the world's greatest teacher. In most American universities and colleges, they have what is called required courses and elective courses. Now, in life, there are certain required courses. What are they? There are three. Three required courses and three elective courses that I want you to think about tonight. The first required course is life itself. Philosophy means the study of life and ideas concerning life. And one of the most discussed new books published last summer was The Philosophers, in which 20 of the most influential philosophers of the Western world in modern times are psychoanalyzed as to the amount of fulfillment that they themselves enjoy. And it, it, so demon, it demonstrated that all 20 of them that they studied were characterized by loneliness and anxiety. You see, we did not choose to be born. We were not consulted about living. And there's nothing you can do to stop living. We did not choose where to be born. We did not choose what color of skin we have. There's no escaping life. Oh, you say, I can commit suicide. That doesn't get you out of life. You only kill the body. Your soul, your spirit is eternal. It lives on. So you cannot escape by suicide. Suicide does not end at all, as some people think. Yes, you're required to live. How do you face life? What resources do you have to call upon when the pressures get great and the crisis comes and the difficulties come? What do you have to call upon? Well, if you know Jesus Christ, you don't have anything to worry about because when he lives in your heart, he gives great inward peace and joy and assurance and a sense of safety and well-being when you come to Christ. It affects you physically and mentally and socially. Every way, every phase of your life is affected when Christ dominates your life because you let him come as Savior as well as Lord. And then the second required course that you have at the university, you're required to die. Now, we have been having a lot of studies on death lately. We read about Dr. Kubler-Ross and Dr. Rawlings and Dr. Moody and others and courses on thanatology in our universities are springing up all over the country teaching people about death and the classrooms are filled with students studying death. George Bernard Shaw said that there's one statistic that we can be sure of. Now, everybody in the gaming business here in Nevada ought to hear this. The odds against which no gambler can win that one out of every one dies. Now that's a sure thing. God said to Hezekiah, thou shalt die and not live. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. The Bible says there's a time to be born and a time to die. The number of years is simply relative. The fact is we all die. And the Bible says there's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed for your death. It may be tonight. It may be tomorrow morning. There's a day, there's an hour, there's a minute already appointed. The Bible says in Job 14, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds beyond which he cannot pass. There's a moment beyond which you cannot live already appointed. And God is giving you this moment of grace right now to find Christ as your Lord and your Savior. That's the reason the Bible always says today, 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 harden not your heart. Now is the accepted time of salvation. The Bible is saying, don't put it off. Tomorrow is the devil's word. Come while you can. There's only one man in history that didn't have to die, and that was Jesus Christ. He said, no man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. He was perfect. He was free from sin and its effects. And yet he died on the cross. Why? Because he died for you. He took the things that caused death in your life on the cross in your place. He died for you. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. And now tonight, 
you come to that cross and surrender your life to Jesus Christ and God says forgiven your sins are forgiven I forgive you I write your name in the book of life for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him but not only did he die he rose again he's alive tonight who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification I haven't seen the picture the raising of the Titanic but I've read about it and they're going to try to raise it next summer and that's going to be a very interesting experiment they're doing a similar thing off the coast of Japan where they found a, a Russian ship and they think it may have 30 billion dollars worth of gold in it and they're after that gold and it's going to be quite interesting to see who gets it when they finally get it all up and uh, so there is a great deal of raising going on but the Bible says there's coming a time when there's going to be a general resurrection when all of those that are lost are going to be raised and all of those that are saved are going to be raised and Jesus Christ died on our account on the cross was raised again and that is living proof he is living proof tonight that there's going to be a resurrection someday think of it Jesus Christ came back from the dead to tell us there's more because he lives I can face tomorrow the Bible says the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death are you ready and then the third thing in this school that is required of you the judgment of God is required you're going to face the judgment there's a movie out called the judgment and someday you're going to give a moral accounting the searching eyes of God will miss nothing in that day when you stand before him now the whole country is talking about who shot J.R. I'll tell you exactly who did it a sinner and someday all the Ewing family and all the suspects are going to have to stand before God just like you are and every idle word that men shall speak they shall give account in the day of judgment the Bible says many shall say unto me in that day Lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and Lord we've done all these great things in your name but the Bible says God is Jesus is going to say depart from me I never knew you you see, you can be in the church. Last night, a number of Catholic people came forward and Episcopalian people and people who have confirmation. I was confirmed myself when I was about 12 years of age in a, an associate reformed Presbyterian church. And I know what they meant when they came. They wanted to reconfirm their confirmation. What had they promised God? in accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and how many of you tonight need Christ you need to come to him you've been away from him you're in the church your name is on the church roll but you really don't know Christ more than a third of the people that have been coming forward here to receive Christ have no church connections but nearly two-thirds do some of them are back east and they haven't thought about the church since they've been in Reno or in Nevada or in Northern California or wherever you may be come to Christ tonight and receive him into your heart and start all over again now those are the required courses life itself you cannot be unborn you're required to die you're required to face the judgment now there are certain options at the university tonight the University of life first you can choose your way of life the Bible says choose you this day as I said a moment ago, there is a way that seemeth right. Now, some of those roads that seem right, there's the lust of the eye the Bible talks about. Possessions. It seems that to gain all the possessions you can, there's nothing wrong with that, it seems. Things are not wrong, but when your life is centered in the acquisition of physical possessions, then the lust of the eyes has gotten the best of you. And that's sin. And it seems right, but it's wrong. And it leads to a dead end. Then there's the lust of the flesh. Those are the physical things which offer by way of luxury and entertainment. 
some of us are selling our souls for sinful pleasure. Overeating, the wrong use of sex, excessive use of alcohol, all of these things. The scripture says the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Then there's also the pride of life. That seems right. Ego, position, getting the best. Self-interest, but that's a wrong road. We ought to think something of ourselves. We're to love our neighbor as ourselves. We are to love ourselves because you cannot love your neighbor. You cannot be a true Christian without having a respect for yourself. And there's a certain love of self, but not this egocentric thing because the very heart of sin is selfishness. The very heart of sin is ego. And when you come to Christ, your ego has to be surrendered to Christ until he becomes law. And then secondly, not only can you choose your way of life, but you can choose who will be the master of your life. What's going to master your life? What philosophy are you giving your life to? What group are you giving your life to? Who is going to control you? Are you going to control your own life and make a wreck of it? Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. By nature, we want to run our own lives. We think we know better than even God knows. But God has a plan for your life. And his plan is perfect. For every young person here, God has a plan. He has the right person picked out for you to marry if you'd only trust him to help you. He has the right job for you, the right vocation for you. It's all planned. If you'll say, Lord, thy will be done, and you surrender to him and let him become involved in all the affairs of your life. Or some of you that are already married, or maybe you're older now, and your life is all messed up. Did you know that God can rearrange your life after you've messed it up by forgiving your sin? Now, he can't take those scars away of sin. I've watched people come forward here And I've seen many of them as they stood in front of this platform night after night. I've seen them with sin-scarred faces because sin leaves its mark. But God can forgive all that and he can take all that mess that you've made in your life and straighten it all out and get you back on the right road if you'll trust him. You say, well, Billy, suppose I've been divorced in my remarried and my life is all what what'll happen well you can't unscramble eggs but you can start from where you are by trusting Christ where you are he'll forgive the past and give you a whole new spiritual life and give you a power beyond anything you ever dreamed and a love and a joy and a peace don't let the devil worry you about past sins once you've been to the cross if your son asks for bread will you give him a snake No, God loves you. He has a plan for you. And you ask for something good, he's not going to give you a snake, says the scripture, said Jesus. The rich young ruler, the problem with him was not his wealth, but he wanted to control his own life. And many of you want to control your own life. You see, we want to run our own lives. Suppose I'd go up in the airliner and tell the pilot, I want to pilot this plane. I've never piloted a plane in my life. I can take over from you. No. God says, get up out of that seat. You're making a wreck of your life. You're heading toward destruction. Let me take the controls of your life. I've been over the road before. Let me help you. And then lastly, you can choose your own destination. The destination is heaven or hell. The Bible says, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. What are we to do? What can you do tonight to make your peace with God? The Bible says, prepare to meet God. Well, how do you prepare? First, by repentance. Repentance means that you're willing to let God change your life. It means that you change your mind so much that it changes the way you live. And you're willing to give up all those things that are sinful in your life. 
and turn over to Jesus Christ your life. The second thing, you come by faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, says the Bible. Just believe. You say, well, there must be a catch somewhere. There is. That word believe means that you put your total confidence in. You don't put your confidence in your own work. You don't put your confidence in anything but the person of Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you. You cannot work your way. You cannot pay your way. You come by simple childlike faith. And then the third thing, you must be willing to be a disciple or a follower of Christ. Earlier in the year, it was my privilege to hold a 10-day mission at Cambridge University in England, as well as Oxford University. And I could not help but remember that young man at Cambridge who made this statement when he gave his life to Christ. He was the son of a very wealthy man, and he was one of the greatest cricketers that Cambridge has ever had. He said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice that I can make for him can be too great. That was C.T. Studd who said that. And he went out as a missionary with the Cambridge Seven that started a whole missionary movement at the end of the last century. Jim Elliott, who was killed by the Orca Indians in South America as a young student, wrote this. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. I ask you, young and old alike tonight, do you know Christ? Is he your Lord and your Savior? In a few moments, I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of this platform as we saw over 500 last night do. And stand here and say, by coming symbolically, I open my heart to Christ. I want him to forgive my sins and change my life. I want to know where I'm going. I want to know what life is all about, and I want fulfillment in my life. I ask you to come publicly because every person Jesus called in the Bible, he called publicly. I ask you to come publicly because there's a psychological and a biblical reason for you to come. You stand here a moment, and after you've come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and then give you some literature to help you in your Christian life. There's something about coming forward like that that settles it and seals it. You that are in the other auditorium where we were a moment ago, where thousands of people are gathered, you come forward in your auditorium where you are. Grady Wilson will be there to say a word and to help you, and many counselors are there as well. And then you that are watching by television, you pick up the phone right now and call the number on your screen. Don't let this moment pass because there may never be another moment quite like this in your life when you're so close to the kingdom of God and all it needs is a, is a phone call to talk to someone. And then if you don't get through immediately, wait a moment or two and call again. Wait five minutes or ten minutes, call again. But don't let this night pass. Those people, some of them will be there for several hours to answer your phone. You get up and come right here as people are making their decisions here and in the other auditorium and all over America right now. You join them and come and stand here and say yes to Christ. We're going to wait on you. You may be in the choir. You may be a leader in the church. Or you may not have any church connections. Whoever you are, God has spoken to you. Get up and come. We're going to wait on you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that many scores of people, I suppose hundreds of people, are coming to make this commitment here in Reno, Nevada. You can make that same commitment right now where you are. Just pick up the phone and call that number that's on your screen. 
and have a talk with that counselor and tell them what you want to do or make the decision right where you are. Maybe your circumstances are such you cannot call right now. All right, make your commitment now. Bow your head and say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at... From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now tonight, I want you to turn with me to a familiar passage of Scripture, Galatians, the sixth chapter, Galatians, the sixth chapter and the 14th verse. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I under the world. Just after the war, Cliff Barrows and I uh, came together he led the singing and I did the preaching. And his wife and my wife and the four of us went to England and we lived in England during the winter of 1946 and 47. Now London was almost totally devastated. And one of the things I remember is that in all that devastation after the war and all the rubble, there stood St. Paul's Cathedral. And on top of St. Paul's was a cross. I remember when Coventry Cathedral was being built because it had been destroyed during the war and it was nearing completion. A cross was lowered by helicopter and placed on the top. A huge 25 foot wooden cross stands above the fields of the buried horror of Belson concentration camp. A tiny cross placed there by Sir Edmund Hillary the first man to conquer the peak of mountains is buried on the snow and the ice at the summit of Mount Everest. Now you, many of you, are very religious and you have embossed upon your Bibles a cross or you wear a cross around your neck. And the thing that I want to ask you tonight is this, what does the cross mean to you? Why do all the Catholic churches and all the Protestant churches have a cross? That's the one thing we agree on is the cross. The whole Christian world looks to the cross. Why did Paul say that he gloried in it more than anything else in all the world? Paul could have gloried in his education. He was one of the most educated men of his time. He could have gloried in his religion. He was very religious. He could have gloried in his ability to speak several languages. He was fluent in several. He could have gloried in the fact that he was a Roman citizen, but he didn't. Or he could have gloried in certain things about Jesus Christ other than the cross. His spectacular, miraculous birth, born of a virgin, the Virgin Mary. Or the great teaching of Christ. Even today, educators say there's never been a teacher like Jesus Christ. Or his great social work. His compassion for the poor and the needy. His concern for the hungry and the sick. His amazing resurrection from the dead. His future glory when he's going to rule the world. And his kingdom is going to come. He could have gloried in any of those things, but he said, no. I glory only in the cross. And he said, God forbid that I should glory in anything else except the cross. Why? Well, I want you to think a moment and look at that cross. It was the most cruel of all punishments because the victims sometimes would hang there for several days. It took them several days to die. And on this occasion, they were crucifying three people, two thieves, murderers, and Jesus in the middle. The soldiers entered the guardhouse and brought Jesus with the two other condemned men. They were beaten 33 times or 39 times on their bare backs with leather thongs with steel pellets on the end. A crown of thorns had been put on Jesus' brow. A cross was laid upon his back. The procession started. Jerusalem was filled with a carnival-like atmosphere at that time. And the procession went through the main streets so that all might see 
that the criminal and be warned of a similar fate if he broke the laws of Rome. A big crowd was following. Just a few of Jesus' friends were following. And Jesus became weakened by the loss of blood and he fell. And so Simon of Cyrene, an African, helped him carry the cross. The soldiers went quickly and methodically about their task of driving home the nails in his hands and the spike through his feet. The crowd mills around jeering. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. They laughed and they mocked and they made fun of him. Come down. Do just one more miracle, they said. But he didn't do it. He stayed there. And you know why he stayed there? Because of you. Because he loved you. Because you see, only in Jesus Christ can we find forgiveness of sins. He was bearing our sins on the cross. People ask me constantly as they write, is there any hope for me? Can Christ save me? Prostitutes, alcoholics, robbers, murderers, prisoners, people filled with racial prejudice, people who hold in their hearts anti-Semitism. Is there any hope for me? People who have done many evil things, both corporately and privately. Is there any hope for me? A bishop of a church in another country came to me one time, some years ago now. And he told me that he did not believe that he was saved. He said, I've been to theological school in England. He said, I've been a bishop now. And he told me how many years. But he said, I have so many doubts that, I'm, that my sins are forgiven and I'm going to heaven. And he said, I've come to you to ask you if you would pray for me and pray with me. And very simply, I talked to him just like he was a little child, as though he had never heard the gospel before. Tears came streaming down his face and he got on his knees and he prayed a very simple prayer, which indicates to me that you can even be a clergyman, be in the church. I know a man in St. Louis, pastor of a large church. He was converted to Christ under his own preaching. He'd never known Christ and suddenly the Spirit of God spoke to him. I know a man here in Boston who was pastor of a church that was dying. He had a brilliant education from one of your great theological seminaries here. And his little daughter got sick and he thought she was dying. And he said, Lord, he said, if you will raise up my daughter from now on, I'll turn to the Bible and preach nothing but the Bible and accept your word as the word of faith. And that happened. Within a year, his church was packed out. Now he's pastor of a great church in Florida. Some of you know him. Paul gloried in the cross because it is the only way of salvation. Nothing else will save the cross is the only way. There is a way, the Bible says. Oh, there, there are other ways of salvation. So we're taught by many teachers that seemeth right. But the end thereof is the way of death. There's only one way, by the cross. And that's one reason why people don't like to talk about the cross or the exclusiveness of salvation. We like to think that there are many ways. And there are many ways that people worship and there are many ways that people pray. And God does hear the prayers of all people all over the world. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be heard. But there's only one way outlined in the Bible. And I as a minister of the gospel must declare unto you what the apostle Peter said. There's therefore now no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. I didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said, as I've already quoted, enter in at the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in there. 
because narrow is the gate and hard is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Notice he says it's hard. It's not easy to follow Christ. You pay a price. He said, if you're not willing to deny self and take up the cross, you cannot be my follower. You see, we would like something cheap and something easy. His demands were so high that many people refused to go with him any further. They'd go so far and then they'd turn away. Because he turned to a crowd one day and said, count the cost. Count the cost. If you follow me, that means that I become Lord of your life. If you follow me, that means you become my learner, my disciple, and you must do my commands. You've got to love your neighbors yourself if you follow me. If you follow me, you've got to be concerned about the needs of the world. If you follow me, You've got to be willing to take up the cross. I'm going to die on a cross. I'm going to be executed. That means that you're willing to go back to your school and back to your home and back to your neighborhood and tell the people that you know Christ and let them see Christ in you. And that won't be easy. But if you'll do that, he'll be with you. He doesn't ask us to live the Christian life alone. I cannot live the Christian life. I'll be honest with you. I cannot do it. But Christ can live it through me if I will let him. And he can produce the fruit of the Spirit. He can give me a love and a joy and a peace that I'll never find anywhere in this world. He can give me the certainty of my eternal life. Now Jesus also warned us that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not preached in your name? And in your name we've cast out demons. And in your name we've done many wonderful works. And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, you can go to church. You can be a good person. And maybe really never know Christ. I know many people that live moral lives that are agnostics and even atheists. There comes a point, there comes a moment sometime, somewhere when you must receive Christ into your heart. Paul gloried in the cross because it expresses the depth of sin, because it shows the love of God, because it's the only way of salvation, and fourthly, because he knew that it gave a new dynamic to life. Once you've been to the cross, you can never be the same. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new, the scripture says. You'll never be the same once you come to Christ. I remember the night I came to Christ. I stood with about three or four hundred other people, made my commitment to Christ. And while I was standing there, I felt like a fool. I started turning around and go back. A woman next to me was weeping and I didn't have any tears. I had no emotion at all except fear, afraid that, of standing in front of so many people. But I went home that night and I remember it was a moonlight night. And we lived on a farm. And I looked out across the field, and across the woods. And I knew something had happened to me that night. I didn't know what, if you'd asked me the next day what had happened to me, I could not have told you. I now know. That first step was so weak and my faith was so weak and I had so many doubts. But my goodness, the transformation that began working its way into my life over a period of time was so tremendous. And it's still working. And it's still growing and I'm still learning and it gets better every day. And then f fifthly, fifthly, it's a motivation for service, a motivation for service. Did you see Mother Teresa getting that award? And then she won the Nobel Peace Prize two or three years ago. 
And she's won so many awards. And she said, I owe it all to the cross. Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize and they asked him something about it and he said, it was built upon my father's evangelical preaching. I know his father and I knew Martin Luther King, of course. And his father always preached the gospel and believed in the cross. And so did Martin Luther King, Jr. Do you know Christ? It's a motivation for service. What motivates you? To go out and help the hungry and the poor and the oppressed. My son spends his time, a great deal of it, in the third world. Helping the poor and the needy. Going to little dispensaries and little hospitals and sending doctors to help them. And he was out on one of those boats in the China Sea helping pick up those refugees a couple of years ago. What motivates him? Why does he go to some place in Africa or go all through New Guinea or go through India or Bangladesh or some of these places to try to help? Because he loves Christ. It's Christ that motivates him. What motivates you? Or do you have any motivation at all to help others? And then Paul gloried in the cross because he knew that it guaranteed a future life. The cross was followed by the resurrection. But God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And the scripture tells us in a grand anthem in the book of Revelation, the fifth chapter. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For Thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by Thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God a kingdom of priests, and we shall reign on earth. What a glorious future we have because of the cross. Some of you are watching by television. Pick up that phone and call that number that's there right now and talk to the person and tell them your need and share with them and they will talk to you. And you can find Christ tonight or you can find help for your problem or your need, whatever it is. Now, what was the attitude of the crowd that was there that day? Christ dying on the cross. First, there was the attitude of apathy. Sitting down, they watched him there. That's indifference. Many here this evening who are completely indifferent to what I'm saying and to the gospel. The mockings, the abuse, and the atrocity of that ancient pagan mob were less painful to Christ than the indifference of a modern world upon which the light of the gospel has been shining all these years. Here in New England, no place in all the world has had more gospel than you've had in your past history. How many today are indifferent? Too much is given, much is required. You see, more is going to be required of you. Where you've had the gospel for so many years and so many Bibles and so many churches and now the television and the radio, then those people in China or people in other countries that don't have the gospel as freely as we have it today. And then there's the attitude of the skeptic and the cynic. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, you that destroy the temple and you build it in three days, say to yourself, come down from the cross. And there are skeptics here tonight, I know that. We've had many a skeptic come to the meeting and have his life changed. I remember the great scientist from the University of Minnesota who came. Skeptical. But three days after that service, he found Christ and became a wonderful Bible teacher on the faculty at the university. Then there's the attitude that saves. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister. And then there was the attitude of the centurion who said, truly, this is the son of the living God. My wife was born and reared in China. And in Chinese, the word come is written with three characters, each of which is a cross with a person on it. We're translating tonight in Chinese, both Mandarin and in Cantonese. 
The cross in all languages means come to the cross, find salvation. Come to the cross and find peace. Come to the cross and find forgiveness. Come is the invitation of the whole Bible. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Come to the cross. I'm asking you tonight to come to the cross. You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. Christ has paid the price on the cross. He's been raised from the dead. That is the heart of what is called the good news, the gospel. The good news is that God loves you. He gave his son to die for you. He will forgive you of your sins. He will give you eternal life tonight. You don't have to wait till tomorrow, tonight. That's the good news, but you must receive it. How do you receive it? First, by repenting of sin. That means to turn, to change your thinking, to change your mind, to change your attitude, and to change your way of living. Let Christ come and be in control of your life. That's repentance. Saying to God, I have sinned and I'm sorry for it. Forgive me. That's repentance. But then you must by faith receive him. And that word faith may trip you up. Faith means that you totally commit to Christ. Just as I'm standing on this platform and my body is committed to this platform, so you stand with your whole life and everything you have, you put on Christ. Your hope is in Him and Him alone. He becomes the one that you trust totally and completely for your salvation. There was a minister preaching on the thief on the cross once and some man yelled from the congregation and said what about that thief on the cross and quick as a flash the minister said which thief because you see one died and was lost and one died and was saved and that's the only story of deathbed repentance in the whole bible so you better not wait the bible says today is the day of salvation now is the accepted time Nowhere in the Bible does it promise you tomorrow. And Jesus said you must do it publicly. He said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me publicly before men, I will not acknowledge you before my Father which is in heaven. That's the reason I ask people to come forward publicly. You see, your coming forward doesn't actually save you. It's coming forward as a symbol of an inward decision you're making in your heart. You're coming and standing with Christ at the cross and saying by coming, I do repent of sin. I do want to change. I do want his forgiveness. I do want a new life. I'm going to ask you right now to get up out of your seat and do what we've seen thousands through New England do. I'm going to ask you to come and stand in front of this platform and say by coming, I want sin forgiven. I want to know when I leave this stadium that Christ is with me and that Christ has forgiven me and that I'm going to heaven. If you have a doubt in your mind, don't you leave this stadium till you've settled it because you may never have another moment when your heart is this close to the kingdom of God. You're not here by accident. I believe you're here in the providence of God. You get up and come right now. We're going to wait on you. hundreds of you quickly. I'm going to ask that no one leave the stadium. This is a very holy and sacred moment. And you be in an attitude of prayer. You can bring your friend with you. If you're with friends or relatives or you've come in one of those buses, they'll wait on you. You get up and come and make this commitment. Here in Boston, we've already seen hundreds of people and you that are watching by television, pick up the telephone and call the person on the other end and have a talk with them. You see that number there. As these are coming forward this evening here at Nickerson, and call that number. God bless you. And be sure and go to church next Sunday. Night after night, we have seen hundreds of people respond here at Nickerson Field to commit their life to Jesus Christ. This is also a moment of decision for you. Make that telephone call right now by calling the number on your screen. Trained counselors are standing by ready to help you.
the lines are busy, just wait a few moments and call again. We'll be there as long as the calls keep coming in. Be sure and join us again tomorrow night for another telecast from the Boston New England Crusade and a special feature that Mr. Graham wants to present to you. Call a friend and ask them to share the program with us. Until then, Cliff Barrows here saying good night and may God richly bless you.